grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. No one likes to suffer. That's the truth of the world. No one indeed in this world wants to have anxiety and pressure and sadness and anger be put upon them. No one in this world would dare wish for that to be put on another. To have someone be in suffering, to have someone feel as if there is no hope or help or any way to go to. No one person desires that for themselves. And yet, it stares us in the face each and every day. That is why Psalms, like Psalms 38, are here. To not try to explain away the suffering, to not try to figure out how to maneuver around it, but to stare it straight in the face and call out to God for help. For indeed, Psalm 38 is a psalm of lament, an outpouring from David's own heart, a heartfelt cry to God. Now you might be wondering, as last week when we had a psalm of praise, which came from the same heart of David, how he was delivered from the hands of his enemies, how God was near him at all times. What happened? They are literally just four verses apart in the book of Psalms. What happened from the joyful praise of David to lamenting and asking God to help him? Well, he's suffering. But why? Why is David suffering here in Psalm 38? The scholars and biblical scholars have looked at over this and many have come to the same conclusion that this was written in a time of David's life where suffering was near at hand every day. It was not the suffering that he had from before when he was fleeing from Saul. It was not the suffering that he had when his friend Jonathan died and Saul died as well. Instead, it comes near the middle end of his reign as king. For David was suffering because of a civil war. David was in pain because his own son was trying to kill him. And David knew, tender conscience that he has, it was because of his sin. Four years before, David looked upon another's wife with lust. And while, and had a child with this other man's wife, Uriah, you might know the story of David and Bathsheba. In this one, the arrows struck Uriah down from a great wall and killed him. And Nathan the prophet, when God told him of David's sin, of how he had cheated, stolen a man's wife, and had a child by her, went to David, pronounced God's judgment, and David a man after God's own heart begged God to forgive him. And indeed, God did forgive him of his sin, but there were consequences. The child died. And the kingdom would be taken from David's hand. Years later, Absalom would do just that. He, who was one of the eldest children of David, would go and kick his father out of his kingdom, would go into the woods and the surrounding wilderness, and David would be chased like a wild animal, all from his beloved son, who was trying to murder him. And David knew he could not get away. It was his sin which did this. And he didn't, and he recognized it. It's very interesting that he says in the very first, second verse of the psalm, your arrows, O Lord, have pierced my flesh. 
When we think of the arrows of this in the Bible, we think the arrows and the slings of the devil, the evil one, the one who we can withstand because we have the breast shield, the faith and righteousness of God. And yet it is the arrows of God, God's suffering, which stick into David. Because all things are from God. For God is God of God, Lord of lords, King of kings. In His hand are all things. And He allows suffering. Let it be suffering because of your and my sin. Suffering because of another person's sin done to us. It matters not. All is from God. And David recognizes this. You cannot get away from it. Sin has brought about this. Ugly, broken relationship. And he can't do anything about it. We can't do anything about it. We can't be able to speak it away. We can't do anything to really fix it. We are like deaf people who cannot hear, mute people who cannot speak. We literally can do nothing about this, and David knows it. The only thing that David can do is bring a heartfelt cry to God and saying, O oh Lord, have mercy upon me. Many are my enemies. They are constantly surrounding me. My sin is ever before me. It is like a burning poison in my veins that wants to burn me alive. Help me, O oh Lord my God. Save me. I am tired. I am burdened. Help me. The prayer of God's people in times of suffering. The prayer of God's people when they need him most. It is the prayer that a Canaanite woman gave to our Lord today. An enemy of God's people in the Old Testament, forsaken by God because of his covenant with Israel. And yet this woman comes. She brings a heartfelt cry to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is strong and mighty to save, who has come to forgive his people from their sins, who will gather people to himself and to the house of God, so it will be called a house of prayer for all people of all nations. And this Canaanite woman, enemy of God's people of old, comes to Jesus and gives a heartfelt cry, not for herself, but for her daughter, who is suffering because of sin, because of a broken relationship between mankind and God, for she is being oppressed severely by a demon. And our Lord and Savior, with loveliness and righteousness and healing in his wings, promptly ignores her. Wait. That doesn't make sense. And yet it stares us in the face. The disciples even get so fed up with her. They go to him and say, stop her wailing. Send her away. Some of the other gospels says, just heal her daughter so that she will stop bugging us. And Jesus turns to the disciples and says, I've only come for the lost sheep of Israel. But the woman comes to Jesus, begs and says, Oh Lord my God, help me. Let your mercy be upon me. Let me know of your salvation. The same cry that David said at the end of Psalm 38, Oh Lord, have mercy upon me. And Jesus looks to her, and he says, it is not right to give bread that was meant for children to the dogs. How of a harsh statement is that? When this woman needed comfort the most, our Lord says, it's not right. You are an enemy of God's people. It is not right that you get forgiveness. I have a covenant with Israel. I am their God, not your God. I came for them, so that they might have salvation, that I might keep all the promises I made to them, 
You are an enemy of those people. You are an enemy of me. You are nothing more than a dog. And you know what she says? Yes, Lord! She agrees with him. She knows that she is an enemy of God. That her people have been enemies of God. That she is nothing more than a lowly sinner who has done nothing to deserve an outpouring of grace by God, who does not deserve the bread of forgiveness and life that was given to the people in the wilderness. It was not hers to get eternal life and joy and forgiveness of sins. She acknowledges every single bit of that in two words, yes, Lord. And, but even the dog eats the crumb that falls from their master's table. And at the same time, she acknowledges a beautiful statement of faith that if you would just give me a single crumb of that life-giving bread, one sip of a life-giving water, not even a sip, a droplet, it would be enough for me. There are two times in Matthew when uh, Jesus declares, great is your faith. And it wasn't to any of the people of Israel. It was to two Gentiles. The first was a Roman centurion, the current enemy of God's people, Rome. And the second was this Canaanite woman, the old enemy of God's people, Canaanite. And he says, woman, Great is your faith. For she knew as we knew that we are sinners who have fallen short the glory of God, but are justified freely by His grace. That He has given His grace to all people. And so the Lord, looking upon this woman, gives her not a crumb, but a full portion. Gives her the life-saving bread. He goes to the cross so that he might pay for the sins, not just of Israel, but of the whole world. He goes and proclaims throughout the entire world, not just to a small section, that he is the Lord of forgiveness, of him who abounds in steadfast love, of him who gives life and light and healing. And he is the one who hears the prayers of all, who will call and fulfill what is said in the Old Testament, that his house will be a house of prayer to all peoples. And even at the end of Matthew, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, bringing all people to know and see the goodness of the Lord. Because the Lord hears the cries, the heartfelt cry of the people to those who are near him, and to those who need him most, he hears those cries and he promises to answer it. And he does so. Not because of who you are, not because of what you've done, but because of who he is. A saving Lord who is full of forgiveness who has given us even a foretaste of that forgiveness in his body and his blood today in Holy Communion. A way that we may know that we truly have forgiveness of our sins and life everlasting, not receiving a crumb or a droplet, but a full portion of God's grace given and shed for us. This is why these psalms of cry and lament are so important. For yes, they acknowledge the sin within us. They acknowledge our pain. They acknowledge the suffering we feel because of the world, because of sin, because of ourselves, and because of others. And we can bring it all before God, knowing that He hears and answers, knowing that He looks upon us, His people, and says, great is your faith. Receive forgiveness and life. So may we give our heartfelt cry to God, going to Him at all times, 
with our cares, with our hurt, with our suffering, and knowing that Jesus hears, answers, forgives, and gives life. Amen.